Hello there everybody, Mr Conway here again and I'm going to continue reading Lemony Snicket's The Bad Beginning. This is book one of a series of unfortunate events. Now what's happened thus far is the Brutalair children unfortunately have lost both their parents in a fire at their house. Brutalair children were at a beach at the time. Now all of the wealth and fortune of Mr and Mrs Brutalair has been left to Violet who is the oldest of the Brutalair children but she can't access the money until she becomes of age. Now the children have been adopted by their nearest relative Count Olaf, which you must have figured out by now is a terrible, terrible person. Now through a series of unfortunate events, the children have discovered that Count Olaf and his theatre friends are trying to plot a secret plan to steal the money from the Baudelaire children. Chapter 5 Unless you have been very, very lucky, you have undoubtedly experienced events in your life that have made you cry. So unless you have been very, very lucky, you know that a good long session of weeping can often make you feel much better, even if your circumstances have not changed one bit. So it was with the Brudelaire orphans. Having cried all night, they rose the next morning feeling as if a weight had been lifted off their shoulders. The three children knew, of course, that they were still in a terrible situation, but they thought they might do something to make it better. The morning's note from Count Olaf ordered them to chop firewood in the backyard, and as Violet and Klaus swung the axe down over each log to break it into smaller pieces, they discussed possible plans of action, while Sonny chewed meditatively on a small piece of wood. Clearly, Klaus said, fingering the, the ugly bruise on his face where Count Olaf had struck him, We can't stay here any longer. I would rather take my chances on the streets than live in this terrible place. But who knows what misfortunes would befall us on the streets? Violet pointed out. At least here we have a roof over our heads. I wish our parents' money could be used now instead of when you come of age, Klaus said. Then we could buy a castle and live in it, with armed guards patrolling the outside to keep out Count Olaf and his troop. And I could have a large inventing studio, Violet said wistfully. She swung, she swung the axe down and split a log nearly neatly in two, filled with gears and pulleys and wires and an elaborate computer system. Oh, and I could have a large library, Klaus said, as comfortable as just his Strauss's, but more enormous. Gibbo! Sonny shrieked, which appeared to mean, and I could have lots of things to bite. But in the meantime, Violet said, we have to do something about our predicament. Perhaps now just as Strauss could adopt us, Klaus said. She said we were always welcome in her home, but she meant for us, a, she meant our for a visit, or to use her library. Violet pointed out. She didn't mean to live. Perhaps if we explained our situation to her, she would agree to adopt us, Klaus said hopefully. But when Violet looked at him, she saw that he knew it was of no use. Adoption is an enormous decision and not likely to happen impulsively. I am sure you in your life have occasionally wished to be raised by different people than the ones that you, than the ones that who are raising you now. But knew in your heart that the chances of this were very, very slim. I, I think we should go see Mr. Poe, Violet said. He told us when he dropped us here that we could contact him at the bank if we had any questions. Oh, well, we don't really have a question, Klaus said. We have a complaint. He was thinking of Mr. Poe walking around them up at Briny Beach with his terrible message, even though the fire was, of course, not Mr. Poe's fault. Klaus had reluctant to see Mr. Poe because he was afraid of getting even more bad news. I can't think of anyone else to contact, Violet said. Mr. Poe is in charge of our affairs and I'm sure he knew, if he knew how horrid Count Olaf is, he would take us right out of here. Klaus pictured Mr. Poe arriving in his car and putting the Baudelaire orphans inside to go somewhere else and felt a string of hope. Anywhere, anywhere would be better than here. Okay, he said, let's get this firewood all chopped and we'll go to the bank. Invigorated by their plan, the Brutalair often swung their axes at amazing speed, and soon enough they were done chopping firewood and ready to go to the bank. They remembered Count Olaf saying he had a map of the city, and they looked thoroughly for it. But they couldn't find any trace of a map, and decided it must be in the tower, where they were forbidden to go. So, without directions of any sort, the Brutalair children set off for the city's banking district in hopes of finding Mr. Poe. Now, after walking through the meat district, the flower district, and the sculpture district, the three children arrived at the banking district, pausing to take a refreshing sip of water at the fountain of Victoria's finance. The banking district consisted of several wide streets with large marble buildings on each side of them, all banked. They went first to Trustworthy Bank, and then to Faithful Savings and Loan, and then to Servants Financial Services, each time inquiring for Mr. Poe. 
Finally, a receptionist that was observant said she knew that Mr. Poe worked down the street at Mulcturry Bank, uh, Mulcturry Morning Money Management. The building was square and rather plain looking, though once inside the three orphans were intimidated by the hustle and bustle of the people as they raced round the large echoey room. Finally, they asked a uniformed guard whether they had arrived at the right place to speak to Mr. Poe, and he led them into a large office with many file cabinets and no windows. Why, hello, said Mr. Poe in a puzzled tone of voice. He was sitting at a desk covered in tight papers that looked important and boring, surrounding, an, surrounding a, a small friend of his wife and two beastly children. Um, there were three tele telephones and flashing lights. Please, come in now. Thank you, said Klaus, shaking Mr. Poe's hand. The bootleg youngster sat down in the three large and uncomfortable chairs. Mr. Poe opened his mouth to speak, but had to cough into a handkerchief before he could begin. I, I am very busy today, he said finally, so I don't have much time to chat. Next time, you should call ahead of time when you plan, when you plan on being in the neighbourhood, and I will put some time aside to take you to lunch. That would be very pleasant, Violet said, and we're sorry we didn't contact you before. We stopped by, but we find ourselves in an urgent situation. Count Olaf is a madman, Klaus said, getting right to the point. We cannot stay with him. He struck Klaus across the face. See his bruise? Violet said, but just as she said it, one of the telephones rang in a loud, unpleasant wail. Excuse me, Mr. Poe said, and picked up the phone. Poe here, he said, into the receiver. What? Yes, 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 no, yes, thank you. He hung up the phone and looked at the brutal airs as if he had forgotten when they were there. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Poe said. What were you talking about? Oh, yes, can't, Olaf. I'm sorry you don't have a good first impression of him. He was only he has only provided us with one bed, Klaus said. He makes us do a great many difficult chores. He drinks too much wine. E excuse me, Mr. Poe said, as another telephone rang. Poe here, he said. Seven, 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 six and a half, seven. You're welcome. He hung up and quickly wrote something down on one of his papers, then looked at the children. I'm sorry, he said. What you were saying about Count Olaf, making you do chores, doesn't sound too bad. He calls us orphans. He has terrible friends. He is always asking about our money. Poco. This was from Sonny. Mr. Poe put up his hand to indicate he had heard enough. Children, children, he said. You must give yourselves time to adjust your new home. You've only been there a few days. We have been there long enough to know Count Olaf is a madman. Klaus said. Mr. Poe sighed and looked at each of the three children. His face was kind, but he didn't look at, like he really believed what the Brutalette orphans were saying. Are you familiar with the Latin term loco parentis? He asked. Violet and Sonny looked at Klaus, the biggest reader of the three. He was the most likely to know vocabulary, words and foreign, and foreign phrases. Something about trains? He asked. Maybe Mr. Poe was going to take them by train to another relative. Mr. Poe shook his head. In loco parentis mean, means acting in the role of parent, he said. It is a legal term, and it, applies to, and it applies to Count Olaf. Now that you are in his care, the Count may raise you using any methods he sees fit. I am sorry if your parents did not make you do any household chores, or if you never saw them drink any wine, or if you like their friends better than Count Olaf's friends, but these are things that you must get used to, as Count Olaf is acting in local parentis. Understood. But he struck my brother, Violet said. Look at his face! As Violet spoke, Mr. Poe reached into his pocket for his handkerchief and, covering his mouth, coughed many, many times into it. He coughed so loudly that Violet could not be certain he had heard her. Whatever, con whatever Count Olaf has done, Mr. Poe said, glancing down at one of his papers and circling the number, he has acted in loco parentis, and there's nothing I can do about it. Your money will be well protected by myself and by the bank, but Count Olaf's parenting techniques are his own business. Now, I hate to usher you out post haste, but I very much have work to do. The children just sat there stunned. Mr. Poe looked up and cleared his throat. <coughs> post haste, he said, means, means you'll do nothing to help us. Violet finished for him. She was shaking with anger and frustration. As one of the phones began ringing, she stood up and walked out of the room, followed by Klaus, who was carrying Sonny. They, they stalked out of the bank and stood on the street, not knowing what to do next. What shall we do next? Klaus asked sadly. Violet stared up at the sky. She wished she could invent something that could take them out of there. It's getting a bit late, she said. We might as well just go back and think of something else tomorrow. Perhaps we can stop and see Justice Strauss. But you said she wouldn't help us, Klaus said. Not for help, Violet said. But 
books. It is very useful when one is learning to learn the difference between literally and figuratively. If something happens literally, it actually happens. If something happens figuratively, it feels like it's happening. If you are literally jumping for joy, for instance, it means you are leaping in the air because you are very happy. If you are figuratively jumping for joy, it means you are so happy you could jump for joy. But you are saving the energy for other matters. The Baudelaire orphans walked back to Count Olaf's neighbourhood and stopped at the home of Justice Strauss, who welcomed them inside and let them choose books from the library. Violet chose several about mechanical inventions. Klaus chose several about wolves and suddenly found a book with many pictures of teeth inside. They then went to their room and, crow uh, and crowded together on the one bed, reading intently and happily. Figuratively, they escaped from Count Olaf and their miserable ex existence. They did not literally escape because they were still in the house and vulnerable, still in his house and vulnerable to Olaf's evil, and vulnerable to Olaf's evil in loco parentis ways. But by immersing themselves in their favourite reading topics, they felt far that they felt far away from the predicament, as if they had escaped. In the situation of the orphans, figuratively escaping was not enough, of course, but at the end of a tiring and hopeless day, it would have to do. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny read their books and, in the back of their minds, hoped that soon their figurative escape would eventually turn into a literal one. Chapter 6 The next morning, when the children stumbled sleepily from their bedroom into the kitchen, um, they found a note from Count Olaf from himself, saying, Good morning, orphans, he said. I have your oatmeal already in balls for you. The children took seats at the table and stared nervously into their oatmeal. If you knew Count Olaf and he suddenly served you a meal, wouldn't you be afraid there was something terrible in it, like poison or ground glass? But instead, Violet, Klaus and Sonny found that fresh raspberries had been sprinkled on top of each of their portions. The Boudelaire orphans hadn't had raspberries since their parents died, although they, had extreme, although they were extremely fond of them. Uh, thank you, Klaus said, carefully picking up one of the raspberries and examining it. Perhaps these were poisonous berries that just looked like delicious ones. Count Olaf, seeing how suspicious Klaus was looking at the berries, smiled and plucked a berry out of Sonny's bone. Looking at each of the three youngsters, he popped it into his mouth and ate it. Hmm, aren't raspberries delicious? he asked. They were my favourite berries when I was your age. Violet turned, tried to picture Count Olaf as a youngster, but couldn't. His shiny eyes, bony hands and shadowy smile all seemed to be things only adults possess. Despite her fear of him, however, she took her spoon in her right hand and began to eat her oatmeal. Count Olaf had eaten some, so it probably wasn't poisonous. And anyway, she wasn't very hungry. Klaus began to eat too, as he did Sunny, who got oatmeal and raspberries all over her face. I received a phone call yesterday, Count Olaf said, from Mr. Poe. He told me you children had been to see him. The children ex exchanged glances. They had hoped their visit had, would be taken in confidence, a phrase which he means kept a secret between Mr. Poe and themselves, and not blabbed to Count Olaf. Mr. Poe told me, Count Olaf said, that you appeared to be having some difficulty just into the life I so graciously provided for you. I'm so sorry to hear that. The children looked at Count Olaf. His face was very serious, as if he were very sorry to hear that, but his eyes were shiny and bright the way they were when someone is telling a joke. Is that so? Violet said. I'm sorry Mr. Bo bothered you. I'm glad he did, Count Olaf said, because I want the three of you to feel at home here, now that I am your father. The children shuddered a little at that, remembering their own kind father and gazing sadly at the poor substitute now sitting across the table from them. Lately, Count Olaf said, I have been very nervous about my performances with the theatre troupe and I'm afraid I, have, I, I may have acted a bit standoffish. Now, the word standoffish is a wonderful one, but it does not describe Count Olaf's behaviour toward the children. It means reluctant to associate with others. And it might describe somebody who, during a party, would stand in the corner and not talk to anyone. It would not describe somebody who provides one bed for three people sleeping, forces them to do their horrible chores and strikes them across the face. There are many words for people like that, but standoffish is not one of them. Klaus knew the word standoffish and almost laughed out loud at Olaf's incorrect use of it, but his face still had a bruise on it, so Klaus remained silent. Therefore, to make you feel a little more at home here, I would like to have you participate in my next play. Perhaps if you took part in the work I do, you could be less likely to run off and complain to Mr. Poe. In 
what way would we participate? Violet asked. She was thinking of all the chores they already did for Count Olaf and was not in the mood to do more. Well, Count Olaf said, his eyes shining brightly, the play is called The Marvellous Marriage. And it is written by the great writer Al Funkut. We will give only one performance of this on, of, on this on Friday night. It is, a, it, is a, it is about a man who is very brave and very intelligent, played by me. In a finale, he marries a young, beautiful woman he loves in front of a crowd of cheering people. You, Klaus, and you, Sonny, will play some of the cheering people in the crowd. But we're shorter than most adults, though, Klaus said. Won't that look strange to the audience? You will be playing two midgets who attend the wedding, Olaf said patiently. And what will I do? Violet asked. I am very handy with tools, so perhaps I could help you build the set. Build the set, heavens! No, Count Olaf said. A pretty girl like you shouldn't be working backstage. But I'd actually like to, Violet said. Count Olaf's one eyebrow raised slightly, and the brutal air orphans recognised the sign of his anger. But then the eyebrow went down again, as he forced himself to remain calm. But I have such an important role for you on stage, he said. You are going to play the woman I marry. Violet felt her oatmeal and raspberry shift around in her stomach as if she had just caught the flu. It was bad enough having Count Olaf acting in loco parentis and announcing himself as their father, but to consider this man her husband even for the purpose of a play, was even more dreadful. It is a very important role, he continued, his mouth curling up into an unconvincing smile, although you have no lines other than I do, which you will say when Justice Strauss asks you if you will have me. Justice Strauss, Violet said, what does she have to do with it? Oh, well, she has agreed to play the part of the judge, Olaf said behind him, one of the eyes painted on kitchen walls closely watched over each of the Baudelaire children. I asked Justice Strauss to participate because I wanted to be neighbourly as well as fatherly. Count Olaf, Violet said, and then stopped herself. She wanted to argue her way out of playing his bride, but she didn't want to make him angry. Uh, father, she said, I'm not sure I'm talented enough to perform professionally. I would hate to disgrace your good name and the name of Al Funkut. Plus, I'll be very busy in the next few weeks working on my inventions and learning how to repair roast beef, she added quickly, remembering how he had behaved about dinner. Count Olaf reached out one of his spidery hands and stroked Violet on the chin, looking deep into her eyes. You will, he said, Partic you will participate in this theatrical performance. I would prefer it if you would participate voluntarily. But, as I believe Mr. Poe explained to you, I can order you to participate. You must obey. All of sharp and dirty fingernails gently scratched on Violet's chin, and she shivered. The room was very, very quiet, as Olaf finally let go and stood up and left without a word. The Baudelaire children listened to his heavy footsteps go up the stairs to the tower, there where they were forbidden to enter. Well... Klaus said hesitantly. I guess it won't hurt to be in the play. It seems to be very important to him, and we want to keep on his good side. But he must be up to something, Violet said. You don't think those berries are poison, do you? Klaus said worriedly. No, Violet said. Olaf is after the fortune we will inherit. Killing us would do him no good. But what good does it do him to have us to be in a stupid play? Hmm, I don't know, Violet admitted, admitted miserably. She stood up and started washing out the, the oatmeal bowls. I wish we knew something more about the inheritance law, Klaus said. I'll bet Count Olaf has cooked up some plan to get our money, but I don't know what it could be. I guess we could ask Mr. Poe about it, Violet said doubtfully, as Klaus stood, beha stood beside her and dried the dishes. He knows all the Latin legal phrases. But Mr. Poe would probably call, would probably call Count Olaf again, and then he'd know we were on to him. Klaus had pointed out, maybe we should try to talk to Justice Strauss. She's a judge, so she must know about all the laws. But she's also Olaf's neighbour, Violet replied, and she might tell him that what we had asked. <sighs> Klaus took off his glasses, which he often did when he was thinking hard. How could we find out about the law without Olaf's knowledge? Book! Sonny shouted suddenly. She probably meant something like, would somebody please wipe my face? But it made Violet and Klaus look at each other. Oh, look. They were both thinking the same thing. Surely Justice Strauss could have a book on inheritance law. 
Can Olaf didn't leave us to do any chores, Violet said, so I suppose we are free to visit Justice Strauss and her library. Klaus smiled. Yes, indeed, he said, and you know, today I don't think I'll choose a book on worlds. Nor I, Violet said, on mechanical engineering. I think I'd like to read about inheritance law. Well, let's go, Klaus said. Justice Strauss said we could come over soon, and we don't want to be standoffish. At the moment of the word that Count Olaf had used so ridiculously, the Boudelaire children all laughed. Even Sully, who of course did not have a very big vocabulary. Swiftly, they put away the clean oatmeal bowls in the kitchen cupboard, which watched them with painted eyes. Then the three young people ran next door. Friday, the day of the performance, was only a few days off, and the children wanted to figure out Count Olaf's plan as quickly as possible. That's the end of chapter six. So we'll continue reading this in our next video. I hope you enjoyed that, everybody, and I'll see you again soon. Bye!